Hello. This is the second part of my lecture on the so-called physicalists whose researches finally gave rise to the emergence of modern psychology. Most philosopher psychologists had theorized about mental events in terms of invisible high-level processes, association, reason, will, and so on. They had little choice. They had almost no knowledge of the physiology of the brain or of the nervous system. Thus, they largely ignored the question of whether these intellectual processes were made up of physical events. Interest in the physical nature of the brain and the nervous system had already started in the 17th century, however, even though there was then still a lack of observational data. For example, Descartes had speculated about animal spirits coursing through the hollow nerves, and Hobbes the thought of atoms streaming through the nerves. This interest increased in the 18th century and became much more clearly focused with a number of significant experiments. Thus, around 1730, Stephen Hales, the English botanist and chemist, decapitated a frog and pinched the body, which caused its legs to draw up. He then destroyed the spinal cord and pinched it again. This time the legs didn't move. This showed that the source of the reflex action was located in the spinal cord, not the brain, and that there was a difference in reflex and voluntary actions. Much later in 1791, Luigi Galvani, an Italian researcher, hung a frog's leg with part of the spinal cord still attached from a brass hook. When he produced an electrical discharge from a nearby Leyden jar, the leg kicked he thus concluded that animal electricity, generated in the muscles and brain, flowed through the nerves and was responsible for movement. Then, in the early 19th century, Charles Bell and Francois Magendi independently established that different nerves had different functions, specifically that there were sensory or afferent nerves in which transmission was towards the spinal cord and brain, and motor or efferent nerves in which transmission flowed away from the brain and spinal cord towards the muscles and organs. This contrasted with Descartes' theory of animal spirits, in which nerve impulses could flow in either direction. Next, in 1839, following the realization that plant tissues are made up of cells, the German physiologist Theodore Schwann advanced the idea that animal tissues also had cells. Then, after he had identified one kind of nerve cell, others soon demonstrated that brain cells consisted of nuclei with long branches that reached and contacted the branches of other brain cells. This contrasted with the ideas of early 19th century physiologists who saw the nervous system like a network of continuous wires. We now turn to a series of discoveries related to the question of the localization of brain functions. As we saw in the previous video, the localization of specific aspects of mental functioning in various parts of the brain was a fundamental part of Franz Gall's theory of phrenology. Right from the beginning, Gall's idea that the brain was divided into different functional areas met with powerful scientific opposition. There were also obvious weaknesses in his research methods. Gall collected and presented cases that fit his theory, rather than measuring random samples of people and finding out whether their head bumps were correlated with particular traits or not. That is, there was no control group. When individuals with cranial prominences didn't have the predicted trait, Gall explained the anomaly away in terms of the balancing action of other brain parts. Thus, he could prove whatever he wanted. Yet, although Gall's theory was wrong in all of its details, it provoked the first genuine empirical studies of the localization of brain function. This began what proved to be an enormously useful research program, with successive brain anatomists from the 1820s through to the 1870s making more exact investigations to examine the question of brain localization. 
The initial response to Gal came from Pierre Florenz. Shocked by Gal's slipshod methodology, Florenz set out to discover by experiment whether specific physiological functions are or are not located in particular areas of the brain. A brilliant physiologist and skilled surgeon, he operated on the brains of various animals, birds, rabbits and dogs, removing small areas of brain and then nursing the animal back to health to see how their behavior was altered by the loss of those brain areas. Obviously he was not able to do such operations on humans, but he assumed that the localization of function would be the same for animals and for humans. Florence found that contrary to Gall's belief that the cerebellum at the back and base of the brain was the organ of amorousness, amativeness in Gall's terminology, its function was the coordination of purposive movement. So a dog uh, whose cerebellum was progressively removed gradually lost the power of orderly movement. Again, small lesions in the cortex did not produce any specific effects, disproving Gall's idea of functionality. But progressive removal of cortical tissue did lead to increasing loss of response to sensory stimulation and the loss of capacity to initiate action uh, until eventually the animal became completely inert. For example, a totally decorticated bird could not fly unless thrown into the air. Florence concluded that the cerebellum and cortex served different purposes, so that these tissues had different functions at a gross level. Within each of these two regions, however, there was no specific localization of function. Functions were generally distributed within each. His was the definitive refutation of Gall's theory. Florence was right that memory and thinking are distributed throughout the cortex. But following his lead, other cognitive neuroscientists were able to identify some particular areas of the brain that were responsible for specific functions. Of these, language was the most striking example of a higher level function carried out by a local area, or in this case, areas. The pioneering study was by Paul Broca. In 1861, a 51-year-old patient at the Paris Asylum had been transferred to the surgical ward for treatment of a gangrened leg. In treating him, Broca found that almost the only word the man could say was tan, and that was his nickname in the hospital. Otherwise, he gestured. Broca learned that tan had come to the asylum 21 years earlier when he had lost the power of speech. He otherwise remained intellectually normal. After some years in the asylum, Tan had also developed paralysis of the right arm and leg. After six days in the surgical ward, the man died. Broca did an autopsy, discovering an egg-sized area on the left side of the brain which had been destroyed. There was almost no tissue at all in the center. It had probably been destroyed by advanced syphilis. Broca reasoned that this area, thereafter called Broca's area, was the site of the control of speech and that at first that was all that Tan had lost, but as the lesion had spread, he had also become paralyzed. Another major contribution to the understanding of the anatomy of speech was made by the German researcher Karl Wernicke. Wernicke discovered that certain patients, who could speak fluently but incomprehensibly, had a lesion in another small area in the left hemisphere of the brain, a few inches to the rear of Broca's area. This was Wernicke's area. Eventually it became clear that Broca's area governed the ability to muster words and structure speech but did not diminish understanding and that Wernicke's area governed language comprehension. Both are needed for normal speech and they are connected by nervous tissue. Damage to these areas produces specific and different consequences. This is a clear indication of the localization of function. Finally, let me mention the German physiologists Gustav Fritz and Edvard Hitzig, uh, who in 1870 applied electrical current to a dog's exposed brain to identify a special region of the cortex as the site of motor control. This was a new approach. Researchers already knew that directly touching an exposed brain did not have obvious measurable consequences. But Hertig had already experimented with applying electricity to soldiers with injured skulls, 
and in this case transferred his experiments from humans to animals. In this short summary of the early study of brain localization, we can see a succession of shifts of understanding, with Gall's initial theory opening up a new way of understanding the brain, but Florenz then disproving Gall's theory of localization, but other researchers in turn showing that Florenz's simple division of the brain into two separate functional areas was inadequate, and that there were specific areas of the brain controlling specific functions. Knowledge of neurophysiology and brain localization continued to progress to the present day. Florenz made the vital point that scientific understanding and development never come to an end. Science is not, it becomes. Swings of theory, therefore, are not surprising. Science, we should suppose, is always provisional and in process. <laughs>